help in that regard to get our cells organized, starting with a definition of what the cell form streams are. Um, it's, it's stream restoration. We've got We've got, uh, I guess, our focus in this meeting today is stream restoration in a pretty specific landscape, in this agricultural drained landscape where we've lowered the drainage network and we're pretty, we, before we even start, we know we must maintain outlet depth. Um, so what is stream restoration? What's, what's a tolerable, what, what's a rational approach to stream restoration within this landscape where we've got tens of thousands of miles of streams to be that have the potential to be doing more work for us, to restore ecological function, to do water quality services for us, to play a more beneficial role within the, the environment. Specifically, the self-forming stream restoration approach depends on self-organization of a complex system. It's driven passively by energy and the natural sources of energy, flowing water, sunshine, uh, inputs of sediment from the watershed, so we're typically looking at a reach of channel with external inputs. And it's described quite nicely by principles of ecological engineering, channel evolution model, which John mentioned, and uh, uh, succession, uh, right down to primary succession even. Self-forming streams are pretty much what every stream is. It's, I mean, no one built all the streams out there on this planet that the streams form. They reform, different things happen, and they reform back to some condition, some state that the watershed wants them to be in, or response to the watershed conditions, the geology, the sediment supply, the energy. Um, the channel evolution model, or the channel succession model, is uh, it's an important enough, it's a, it's a common enough sequence that it's described in the literature very well, has been for a, a long time, where we start in an initial state that's disturbed, it goes through one sequence or another, winding up at another state that's similar to the first state, or at least um, similar to what the watershed is appropriate for the watershed, fit to the watershed condition. The whole idea of the self-forming stream is that we're building that middle stage. We're building that over-widened state, uh, the wide, shallow, flat form with the assumption that it's going to do what every other stream has always done, is continue on with the sequence. The stream in the picture is a stream where we've watched that occur a number of times. It's an unintentional self-formed stream. It was constructed as a big wide flat ditch to be a big wide flat ditch, um, and it keeps turning into a stream, and they keep dipping it out. So I've had the pleasure of watching that turn into a stream a number of times three times now. And we've seen there's no end to the examples of ditches that have been constructed with more width than really what the channel would be happy occupying in the bottom of that, and a narrower inset channel forming flanked by those depositional floodplains. The two-stage ditches that were studied initially, I mean, we didn't start out building these things. We started out studying the self-formed streams that we called two-stage ditches. So the definition between the self-formed streams and two-stage ditches is a pretty fuzzy one, since all of the initial two-stage ditches were actually self-formed streams. Um, and they've been around for, I mean, it's nothing new. These, this, these are things that our grandparents knew about. Um, that have been occurring in the literature for a long time. I'm sorry if I don't have your name up there somewhere, and it belongs, because I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's significant amount of other work that people have noticed these kinds of things happening and wondering what to do with self-formed streams or unintentional self-formed streams within kind of over-widened sections. Around county engineers are always building self-formed streams. They make the channel a little bit extra wide around going into the bridge and leaving the bridge, and you get deposition and a narrower channel forming. So no end to the examples of self-formed streams, unintentional self-formed streams in the landscape. Can I ask a question, Dan, and put our contractors on the spot? Would would you see that that picture? Do you, may not you don't necessarily need to speak for yourself, but maybe the the people who would live along that or that would farm along that. Do you think most folks who are concerned about drainage would see that and say that's not a good ditch that needs to be fixed? Yeah. 
they would assume that that's not going to to carry the water as well as it needs to. We found really good sediment transport where we get to the narrower channel forming, the ditch that John showed up in Michigan, right on the border of uh, Ohio. Um, it, it had pretty poor transport prior to being turned into a two-stage. Uh, it was like this one, that it was a little bit too wide for what the stream wanted to be, um, and thus had set poor sediment transport, had wider, shallower flows, and the muck was accumulating on the bottom of the ditch. But when it was benched out, and give an extra room for the high flows to be dissipated that let the vegetation encroach on the ditch to make it narrower and thus the low flows deeper and the bed sediment actually went up for a while on the downstream end monitoring that because the, it had better sediment transport. It was better able to maintain its outlet depth, which is so critical to drainage, um, because of that narrower inset channel rather than that slightly over wide one. So whether it's three times or one and a half times or what it is, it, I mean, there's a threshold that we kind of bounce around in there. A lot of them are a little bit over wide and that doesn't work so well. Um, we get up to two times the channel width and then we're often seeing some bench formation or some self-forming sequence taking place in there. We get up to three times the channel width and we're pretty confident that we're going to see this uh, channel evolution sequence continue on. The self-forming stream projects that have been done intentionally um, are, are I, I track them um, and have been monitoring them since uh, oh, 2005, I guess, the 48 projects that are, have been monitoring and self-formed streams. Eight of them detailed surveys, uh, repeated detailed surveys, Just to give you an idea of what what we start with, what, what the idea, what, the, what it looks like is uh, if you're building, building these things, whether unintentionally or intentionally, just build a blank. We're building a flat. We, we're looking for primary succession taking off. We want nothing but width for uh, the processes of succession to take hold. So this is, um, I'm losing track. I, I think this is the second after the second growing season, third growing season perhaps, fourth growing season. Um, and then, as John already pointed out, our different uh, target widths. So 30% is, that's probably what's uh, sane to talk about within the drain, drained landscape. You start talking to farmers about having more extensive widths and well, there might be some opportunities within that landscape, but they're going to be pretty few and far between. The 30 percent, the target width, or three times the channel width, about the same thing, um, it is and what, that's what this project is. That's awfully typical. See the repeated cross sections that I do, and I've got this fairly elaborate spreadsheet that lets me. Um, separate out the channel versus the floodplain and monitor the aggradation rates, the maximum bank height rates, the bed scour, the bed aggradation, and see what's just happening at what rates over the years. The other thing that um, is the, my division is looking at somewhat, oh, uh, ag engineering has, has been looking at, is uh, the quality of the soil. And that's a big distinction between a lot of the projects that are done, especially in our lowered landscape, is the where we're working in trying to get riparian areas to form in parent material or subsoil at least. Um, so where there's poor quality soil, that winds up being a real contrast or benefit that's exhibited by the self-forming streams that wind up being really outstanding soil. Uh, getting a uh, maybe a centimeter or two of deposition per year or common aggradation rates in, in these kind of typical systems. Getting that with all this vegetation, uh, herbaceous vegetation growing up with the roots and then the, the plants themselves laying down and getting uh, that layer cake of organic material and the mineral material winds up making some very productive soils. The watershed. Okay, and so the idea is that before it was just carried down the and now it's deposited, that is, so it was topsoil. So you're digging down into subsoil, right. and now the topsoil is going to get deposited on top. Well, 
whatever is coming down from upstream, um, yeah, like most likely topsoil. Okay. Uh, it could be eroding ditch banks from the whole drainage network. It could be other material as well, construction site material could be coming down, so it's not guaranteed to be good quality topsoil. So you're monitoring that and seeing that it's high quality? Uh, it's high quality by this process of uh, this, this layering of usually coarse material winds up deposited first in a natural stream or one of these streams, and then progressively finer material, more organic rich material on the top as aggradation rates slow up. Um, and so that organic matter in there, the the micro, microbial activity, which so much of our services are dependent on, is uh, extremely robust in this. Um, as I'm going to just visually um, uh, seen by, by the vegetation density, very, very robust vegetation in a lot of this. Uh, another kind of typical example with a little bit more width to it, um, just, uh, just a big flat Constructed, you can see in there the meandering form. It's uh, innately just part of flowing water. Uh, the, the first real growing season, and grass is I mean, moist soil. We know what's going to happen. Second or third year probably the fourth year now, with the different patches of trees coming in and um, the rates of change that I'm monitoring. And initially, I was looking at those kind of with a, with a hope that, that it would be pretty fast, that we had a stream that we wanted to form. We had a channel evolution sequence that had a nice stream at the end. How long is it going to take to get there? And I don't think that was what I should have been hoping for. As I've studied more and watched these more, these early successional stages have something to offer that later successional stages won't have. The, we've got low floodplains, uh, meaning more contact between, more interaction between the stream flow and the floodplain flow. Uh, that herbaceous vegetation, not forested, but that herbaceous vegetation has got much higher roughness than it will later. Um, so we've probably got more depositional processes going on, um, very biologically and chemically active, uh, physically active with the through deposition uh, system reach of channel right here. That we're probably doing a lot for the watershed at this stage um, that will diminish with time, not, not get better with time. And it doesn't take long to get that, if it's a single thread habitat that we're really concerned in, it doesn't take a fully aggraded floodplain to accomplish that because the roughness is so high on the floodplain. We've got that single thread channel out there, even though the floodplain's not solid. You have a picnic on it, it's uh, got water standing on it, but uh, we, we've still got the hydraulics that are maintaining, developing and maintaining the single thread in stream kind of habitat. To give you an idea of, again, the range of applicability of the self forming approach, this is. Uh, an example that I'll contrast with the next one. This is a high energy system, the next one will be a low energy system. But this has got a ravine kind of a drainage network, high sediment loads, uh, fairly steep slope. The lower picture is a steep slope from one end to the other, flat from side to side, of course, but that's what we're that's the essence of what we construct. Uniform slope from top to bottom, flat from side to side. Uh, so that's a flat plane that's been constructed with a whole lot of sediment being going to be washed to it and in fairly steep slopes. If we expect something to fail, our traditional natural channel design equations say this is going to fill in with sediment and be an aggradation failure. Um, so let's see what happens as uh, we construct it, stand back and watch. Uh, again, as John mentioned, big storms just shortly after constructed, uh, ten, within 10 days of the equipment leaving the site had a substantial storm that's a, a bar formed, particularly on the upstream end of this, which we would be concerned about filling in the upstream end and uh, aggrading. But water doesn't like to do that. Water likes to form single threads, which this did. So all that's deposition, six tenths of material. My son's standing up there on top of that and with a probe down on the, the constructed surface. 
within one storm we had that much material wash in here, but still that single thread formed as and and then the positive feedback of the the depositional areas, the higher depositional areas, um, getting the additional roughness as vegetation colonizes it, winds up being perfectly satisfactory sediment transport through this system, which is very important. And it has, we've been monitoring it on other sites that uh, in the agricultural landscape that we get the narrow channel then coming out into a broad system, it's not aggrading and filling in the ditches and causing backwater conditions. We get single threads that maintain their outlet depth, much like the one up in Hillsdale County, Michigan, that uh, actually better, was better able to maintain its outlet depth. Because by having this broader system, we're able to narrow things up during low flow where sediment transport is so important. Narrow it up and deepen low flow to maintain that sediment transport. And then over the years with the vegetation, over the years, over three years, um, or just two years now, we've got uh, the finer material depositing on top of that coarser stuff and very robust vegetation, three growing seasons. So there's our, our atypically high energy example. Um, that one, well, the first two examples would be <clears throat> kind of in the middle of this range of stream energies that we see. Stream power is a nice way to talk about the different characters of stream, um, more so than watershed or slope or anything, stream power is a, a, a good number. Um, the, I should explain first, on the far right of this graph is the, that uh, box and whisker is all of the streams in the state of Ohio, the named streams in the state of Ohio, their stream energy. Somewhere up around in the mid-60s uh, is the mean of the typical streams would have a, a stream power of 60 pounds per second per foot. Um, the, the data sets that we're looking at are the streams that have been restored in the state of Ohio. So this is the, basically the, the first wave of streams that have been worked on have been restored um, from a report that Laura Fay and I have just finished up this, earlier this year. Um, so the streams that are being restored are, well, the first observation here is they're atypically low energy. Uh, even the, the ones that we looked at, kind of the typical ditches on the first two examples where this arrow is, they're below what we usually see in streams. Those are the, the ones that have been turned into ditches in the past, the ones that are being moved around today are the lower energy systems from the whole universe of streams that exist out there. They're not our step pool streams, they're not our, our rapids and uh, even the riffle pool. Uh, coarse cobble kind of substrate streams. They're not the ones that are being worked on so much. Um, so the last example was kind of uh, a flyer. That would be way out here on the extreme end of the high energy systems that the, either for normal stream, for the average stream out there, or for certainly the ones that are being restored. The next example is down here, below the mean. Anything below that that solid line in the middle there, but around 10 pounds per foot per second of uh, energy, isn't even in the literature as streams. Streams, like the box and whisker over there, that we're talking about streams. We're not talking about streams down there. The only, the only data set that I've been able to find in the literature um, that talks about that threshold doesn't call them streams, they call them swamp streams. So what should we be expecting in Northwest Ohio what, what should be the condition of, of that kind of low energy? We, we turn them into ditches. If we don't maintain the ditches, this is what they look like. If we let them self-form into the condition that they, that the, or kind of the driving forces determine, what would we expect to happen here? Well, go oh, back one. Um, a, a wetland system, of course, is, is what uh, is um, what what happens in, I don't know, probably appropriately in many of the self-formed kind of um, settings that we're doing stream restoration. But the point is that the self-forming streams, that's a, a something that the self-forming streams 
have to offer or have not to offer. That's a characteristic of them, is that they will form to fit the driving condition. They'll form to be appropriate for the watershed. They'll form for the, the energy, for the sediment supply, for, for those conditions that we, we can't force feed a uh, system like we might be able to do to some extent with a two-stage ditch. Maybe we can force a single thread channel through here if we uh, narrow it up with solid banks. If we build those benches, maybe we can actually get them uh, below that energy threshold where we would have a wetland naturally. But uh, here, for good or bad, we get uh, systems that are appropriate for those processes that we'll be driving and maintaining them. I don't think that the, we're going to be changing the kinds of the driving amount of energy, the flashiness of those things, sediment supply, uh, so much that we're going to dramatically change that threshold between one kind of stream character and another. Um, to, to some extent, that threshold could move up and down the drainage or, or change from one character to another. Um, but no, I, I think it's valid to be concerned about what's going on with the landscape, how that's impacting the, um, the, the streams downstream. Doing the work, the BMPs, the landscape work, the upland work is certainly something to be concerned about and, and try to address or try to address that flashiness if that's a concern. In urban areas, doing stormwater management to address that flashiness, that's certainly a valid thing to be doing continuing to do, trying to get pollutants to not wash off of farm fields, not wash off of urban areas. That's, a, that's all valid, but it all washes off of the landscape. And then the next uh, suite of BMPs that really is a lot of unrealized potential is what happens to all of those issues as they're flowing down the drainage network. They flow down a pipe, they remain the same when they go into the pipe as when they come out of the pipe. They flow down a ditch, pretty much the same in, same out. If they flow down something that is able, we, we can, with our drainage network, we can dampen those, we can mitigate some of those, we, we can, the problems that we send down the watershed in nutrients and sediment is exactly what is used for a self-forming stream to develop itself. Um, the, the area that we build with that chemical, biological, uh, physical, condition is a treatment system. So uh, I think it's, it's thinking about the landscape services, what's going, what, what kind of BMPs are on the landscape, but also trying to figure out how we're going to use, the, how we're, what kind of form are we going to have our drainage network in so that it's part of this treatment train of uh, what, what we're sending down the, out of the watershed. All right, the last point of uh, kind of what our drainage networks, what our stream, what should stream restoration be is what, what is our reference condition? What, what should streams be? I mean, we have got so many low energy streams. Well, we used to have streams that were far more low energy. In North America, the pre-contact, even before pre-settlement, pre-contact, headwater streams typically had 10 to 70 beaver per mile. They were continuous sequences of dams every 300 to 1,000 feet. But the channel types for our first, second, even third order streams were some meandering single thread channels, but a whole lot of uh, small pools and really dominated by wet meadow conditions. Uh, that's, that's 
what was here. So to the extent that we should look at reference conditions as something that we should be trying to restore, that's what our kind of underappreciated or it's been flying under the radar. That's what we that's what was here. If we look at mechanically, what's uh, kind of how can we engineer treatment wetlands? How can we engineer a treatment drainage network? That's not a bad treatment system at all. Uh, so I think as a guiding image, we need to back way up and see how much uh, we can learn from kind of what this drainage network, what these headwater drainage networks had looked like. And uh, certainly the only way that I know to construct or to, to reproduce kind of a wet meadow system would be a self-forming stream. So we can look at all of the different applications of, of the different systems, but for, repro for restoring much of the drainage landscape to what this little guy and all his ancestors did, um, uh, I, I think that's the only design approach that's going to be able to reproduce much of that. Oh, our guiding image there. Anyway, so that's the idea of self-forming streams is open it up, uh, make a blank slate, let primary succession take over. Uh, you see there deer footprint on the left with the matting underneath. You can get that uh, a centimeter of silt on there and the vegetation accumulating and get very robust, active uh, stream restoration. Question or comment? How does the structure of the self-forming stream vary in relationship to what you stay? Could you repeat the question for everybody? The minimum width requirements for the two-stage versus the self-forming? Yeah. I, I think the minimum width requirements for the two-stage came from the self-forming because that's principally what we're looking at is what would be stable, what had formed in these ditches, what kind of widths were required to, to see where that uh, depositional response had occurred. If we see that depositional response, then we're much less likely to see a scour response or we haven't constructed something that doesn't want to be there if I can. Um, so the three times the channel width is what we use for the minimum self-forming as well as the two-stage. This is maybe discussion, so I'm going to come over here closer. But just to, to put this in the context of today, it strikes me that you tend to use the word streams. And I think the audience, you know, so obviously we, we speak with different audiences for different purposes. The audience that I'm thinking of when I think of two-stage ditch implementation and getting more of these in the landscape is not going to think of streams as the uh, restoring streams as our goal, but more to maintain drainage and if we can do it in a more long-term sustainable way, um, that, that makes sense. So I just sort of want to throw that out for your reaction and to, to others as we sort of put into the context that today as we get into more discussion that um, I, I'm wondering if it's helpful to, to um, I don't know, to sort of know this background, but yet most people who you know, here you've got a drained landscape. So that's what we're thinking, you know, a, an agricultural drained landscape. That's not a, um, it, it's quite different than the wet meadow and the you know, beavers and restore. So I'm just wondering if that's something you deal with regularly and what your thoughts are. Yeah, recognized fully early on. I mean, that's two-stage ditches are floodplain restoration. Yes. Uh, that we're, we recognize that an entrenched stream, the first most important thing to restore is to give it at least a minimum amount of floodplain. If, if we could do one thing, then that's it. So okay, that's, and that's, that's how we can put those That's what we do, and, and it was, wasn't, and we don't talk about it as floodplain restoration. Mm -hmm. we, we talk a term, the practice, two-stage ditch. Um, another term that's been used for this that I've used for it, probably the first one that I used for it, was uh, over-wide ditch. Yeah. Yeah, I like the floodplain. But, yeah, but it, I think it's, restoration, I think, will mm -hmm. raise more resistance for many people. Do you think floodplain will be? Okay. I think people 
people understand the floodplains better, certainly never use the word wetlands. That's all we need to stay away from. But uh, anyway, yeah, I think the, the over wide one, I think, was the problem. Yeah, yeah, for whatever the audience is. Yeah. But I, I do think the, the first bit of information in the whole presentation was this is restoration of ecological services or restoration of ecological function. Um, even restoration is, is a prickly word because we're, we're, not re we're not recreating any pre-settlement kind of condition. We're not restoring that. Pre so there's debate in the restoration groups as well about, well, or what, are we, what does restoration mean? Stream restoration to the extent that stream restoration is trying to make our drainage network do stuff that it used to do, do work for us, perform these ecological services. I think it's what it's all about. And whatever words we tack on to the different approaches to doing that, then we use different words for different audiences. 